This is about subcutaneous defibrillator, patient selection, implantation, and troubleshooting. Now, some of you might be involved in putting in ICDs, and some of you might have thought that, you know, if some young person has sudden cardiac death and is having recurrent shocks or is having a recurrent problems, and uh, that person is very tiny or a pediatric patient, then what will be the best defibrillator for this person? Because you cannot have a lead in you for the rest of your life. If with this background, subcutaneous ICDs was developed, and I was told it's been done in Delhi occasionally, so that, that's really good to good. So I'll start with the case, and this is something commonly you will see, a 73-year-old female, say she's left-handed and has a right mastectomy, so the only place you can put in a device is left side, but if she's dominant hand is left, and you want to avoid putting it on the left side. Low EF, sudden death risk, she's referred for an ICD. So in today's time, the options are you just pray and no device is needed, you know, hopefully she makes it and dies of something else. You can get a dual coil transvenous ICD or single coil transvenous ICD, or you can, you know, screen and implant potentially a subcutaneous ICD so that it doesn't interfere in her day-to-day uh, -day life. <coughs> so with this, I'll go over a brief history of some of these devices, why there was such a paradigm shift in implanting these devices, and, we'll, and then we'll look at certain cases and what's the future which holds for these devices. So early pacing was started in 1929 when they tried to resuscitate a stillborn infant. And then Dr. Heyman in 1932 came up with a device. It was like a cycle. You could move the hand of the, 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 the pedal of a cycle and that would give electricity to the heart. But he had so much skepticism that he faced professional skepticism. I'm glad there was no WhatsApp at that time, otherwise he, this could have been gone very, very viral. And the church said that this is like an infernal machine that interferes with the will of God and never find, and he could never ever come up with a way to manufacture his device and this device died a slow death. Now, I don't know in, I don't know here or where you practice, but this is very common occurrence in US that you put in this expensive device and some of them are twiddlers, you know, they just try to move their device in their chest or they try to play with it and then, or they try to pull it and then the device can come out. And if something like that happens, it's like almost 100% mortality because this device is going to get infected right away. So why do we need to change? Why do we need to put in devices which do not have any leads in the heart? Now, for implantation purposes, there's a small risk of pneumothorax. There is pocket infection. It's a big device. You know, if the person is thin, it looks very bad and ugly when that the whole thing sticks out of the chest, and there's a risk for hematoma. The other thing is that if somebody has a device for a long time, it, it's in an unhealthy environment because of the tricuspid valve, because of the shoulder, and all the time the lead is getting injured all the time. Because of that, you know, if there is a new lead which comes out, there's almost an old lead which is dying because there is always a problem with this lead. And especially in Indian situation where people are spending so much money in getting a device, and if the lead fails, then it can become extremely uh, unfortunate. But all leads or most of the leads are going to fail at some point because it's like a device or a machine, it is going to fail at some point. The other thing is that this is a little unappreciated, but a lot of people who have devices, it just follows the principle of Virchow's triad. On devices, you can have thrombus formation, clot formation, and if over a period of time you have a PFO or if you have tricuspid regurgitation, because of that PFO, that clot on the lead can go to the brain and can get, give a big stroke. Now, unfortunately, this cannot be prevented even if you're on 10 anticoagulations and all these meds because it is sitting on the leads and it's not in the bloodstream. Now, these are some of the unique challenges and we see it all the time. So this is an intracardiac echo we were doing and uh, you, know, you can see this thrombus which is fluttering on the lead. Now, if you do a transeptal puncture here to do an AF ablation or some ablation, this whole thrombus is going to go with you and when the patient wakes up, he's going to have a you know, big stroke and uh, he's not going to be a happy person. Hence, you need to come up with a device which is not in the bloodstream, and if you can avoid some of these issues, then it might be a good device. Now, that is subcutaneous ICD. So what it is, is that you have a can, and you have an electrode which goes in the left parasternal space, and the can has two vectors, the device has two vectors, a primary vector which goes from your can to the lower sternal or lower zippy sternal area, 
there is a secondary vector which goes from this suprasternal notch to the can and then you have been between these two electrodes there is a third vector meaning that the device can shock in any of these three vectors to get people out of VT and VF. Now because the electrodes are on the surface of the heart or rather than inside the heart or on the surface of the chest, you are going to have a much better looking electrogram compared to when you have inside the heart. So that, that is uh, helpful. Now how you are going to really offer is that they have a very good screening system in place. So it's not that you implant a device and then it's not going to fail. But there is a simple scale on which you put the patient's QRS and measure. So for example, on this thing, it is unacceptable because the T wave is much bigger than whatever the device cutoff is. But this is acceptable because the QRS and the T wave kind of falls in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, figure so that you, this person will get an appropriate shock if the patient has VT or VF. This patient, because the T wave is much bigger, is going to have T wave over sensing and may have problems uh, because of this. So once you overcome this, and about 5 to 12 percent of patients are going to really fail this initial part of the screening, but if you can pass this screening, then you can potentially be considered for uh, these devices. Now over a period of time, and this was just recently reported at one of our main EP meetings, that most of the people will pass this screening and uh, you will have some sort of vector which is going to be helpful when you are going to uh, check this device. Some unique things what you need to be aware if you, we all have read in anatomy winging of scapula because of uh, damage to the nerve to serratus anterior and that nerve is very close to the area where we are, where we, uh, ablate, uh, where, where we are going to place this device. Now this is how we do it. First of all, we make a small little mark below the left nipple in the mid axillary line. We drape the patient and we have a much bigger drape. Then you create a pocket by opening that area. This is how it is done in a real person. You, you have, you, have uh, you make two incisions, one in the pocket where we create it and then one in the below the zipper sternum and uh, I'll show you how we do the, uh, uh, do the device. You make, you make that cut there. And again, most of these devices are not done in the shoulder area. So again, patients who have had dialysis catheters, patients who have had prior shoulder sh surgeries and all, then you are going to avoid, uh, avoid that region. So here you, we are making a cut, then we'll open that area up, we'll make a nice pocket there, and that's where we are going to put the device. So it's going to be much deeper Patients are not going to see it from the surface and especially it's important for people who are you know, more into cosmetics that this device will be nicely hidden inside. This next step is you make a small incision below it and then with a tool what they have called as a trocar, you put this tool into that pocket, pull a lead back outside and you will see how that is done. This looks a little gruesome because there is a lot of stabbing going on but all these procedures are done under general anesthesia so the patients will not have any uh, pain when you do it and then you are able to put this lead from this pocket and pull it out from here and that's where you are going to secure it to the uh, device. Again if you see this is done in the left parasternal space, this is done just below the nipple and this trocar will come out from this area. You'll see that coming out, and then here you put in a suture, connect the lead, and then you you know bring it back into the uh, zephysternal area. Again, here you are in the submuscular space, so there is some bleeding involved. So best to do it when patients are not on any anticoagulation, and they will need a lot of pain control. Then you cut, connected everything to this suture sleeve. This is the same what you'll have in the regular device and then you put it inside the sternum on the right or left side of it and then once that goes in you can um, close it up and then you know you are done with this device then we check DFTs in the end and make sure they are satisfactory before we um, close it up. This is how it looks like on an x-ray so I heard there are some devices done here so if you see them in your hospital you will see this as the can typical pacemaker ICD cans are here but you will see the can here and you'll see a small electrode here somewhere, and that's how they look on an um, that's how they look on an X-ray. Now, which kind of patients would really benefit are patients 
preference you know somebody is you know really wants that uh, doesn't want any scar which is visible so that will be number one younger patients may benefit from it more because then you don't have to worry about lead related problems over a period of time patients who are very active or athletes they don't if they don't want to get trauma on the shoulder then they can do it and then patients who are at high infection risk dialysis prior surgeries tricuspid valve replacement so that you can't put in a device through the a tricuspid valve then it might this might be a good indication to uh, do it <coughs> now when you compare this with the traditional icd there's really no difference among all cause shock appropriate shock inappropriate shock or any of these things so it it, it works out really well compared to a transvenous icd as a first step certain situations you want to avoid one of them is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy the reason for that they have a very big qrs because of lvh and they have high, and they have a tall t wave so they may fail the screen and then patients may get inappropriate shocks because of that congenital heart disease is one place where you can do it really well because their anatomy is altered but you can put the electrode this is on the right side of the sternum compared to the left side of the sternum this was in a patient with uh, pulmonary atresia where the standard screening had failed the patient had a tricuspid uh, a percutaneous tricuspid valve and we didn't want to cross that hence uh, this one was this was uh, done similarly you know down the line the things which are really going to occur in sub q icd is that you know we need to have a way where we can pace it for example this was one patient we had who failed his dfts dft is you know the device is going to fail giving appropriate shock so if you are going to put this expensive device in you want to make sure it works but then you can be little bit smart with it and move the leads around so that now this one we put a his lead below his sternum so it was right on surface of the heart and we had better dfts that way so that uh, uh, so that worked out really good in him and now you can even pace from here so if somebody is pacemaker dependent and you can put in a pacemaker for some reason you can even pace from here and that's going to capture and hopefully that's also going to work now total subcutaneous icd again the advantages are there is no intravascular leads infection risk is almost zero no valve injury no valve injury related tricuspid regurgitation very less risk of stroke and there is no vascular access so no risk of pneumothorax or anything some of the limitations today are limited pacing support it's not going to pace you all the time there is no anti tachycardia uh, pacing again if the patient over a period of time requires a crt then this device at least today is not good, going to be helpful but the device lasts much longer and uh, if the, your patient passes the screening process then uh, this device will be helpful so typically if my, the way the whom i am going to offer this device is a young lady or a young man who has a brugada syndrome long qt syndrome or who is going to not pace much down the line or somebody who has non ischemic cardiomyopathy with a normal pr interval who is not going to pace a whole lot then those kind of or somebody who has dialysis no vascular access and very very sick and those are the kind of people who are really going to uh, get this device and this is what we uh, covered so in conclusion subcutaneous icd is an attractive options for patients who do not need pacing or anti tachycardia pacing I, but anti tachycardia pacing and bradycardia pacing will be available soon so this was just step one in the iteration and you will going to see more of it again it is very attractive in younger patients and we have lot of uh, you know models and uh, you know sports people who don't want to be seen to have a device for various reasons or tennis players for example when they are going to use their shoulder a lot then there is no chance of injury to the lead because of that the current only limitation is the battery is slightly shorter but nowadays even the batteries can last up to 10 years the newer version what they have there is a slightly higher risk of inappropriate shock but no not sig statistically significant but again the main thing is that you are not worried about the longevity of the lead and no real risk of complications when you do this and it's very appealing to the patients because nobody will ever know that the patient has or the person has a device because nothing is seen from outside so this is something which will be you know coming up a lot more right now it is only done by boston scientific but some other companies are also interested and over a period of time it will get more competitive and the cost might come down little later so i think i'll stop there and if you have any questions about that we can go over it is dft why is dft mandatory in subcutaneous icd 
you know today it is mandatory because it is new device so whenever something is new you really want to test and make sure everything works out well like if you look at transvenous icds you know nowadays it's not recommended to do dfts because of the simple trial and everything else but because this is still new like five years back the company mandates that you have to do it but you can choose not to do it technical uh, complications in when we replace the battery necessary so we haven't had any patient with whom we have replaced the battery because the device was approved like four years yeah. back. So we don't have any experience yet. But I, I doubt there will be much of complication because the same surgery you do it and you take it out and put in a new thing in. So we actually have plastic surgeon make the pocket and do it so that you know it looks really beautiful. So nobody will ever find out what happened. Uh, thank you again for such a wonderful presentation. Yeah. I was about to comment about this. What is the role of the surgeon <coughs> in your uh, team, especially while uh, trying to insert a subcutaneous ICD? So, so first rule of surgeon is to say no, that he cannot put in an epicardial ICD for whatever reason. So once that is ruled out, then, you know, so, so the options are either you put a conventional tri transvenous ICD, second option is to put in an epicardial ICD like epicardial pacemaker, and third option is to put in a trans uh, the subcutaneous ICD. So surgeon's role come in epicardial ICD, but beyond that for doing the procedure, cardiac surgeon or general surgeon has no role. We occasionally call plastic surgeon just to make it look beautiful at some times. And, um, um, anesthesia has a general anesthesia yeah. and patients need sedation and a lot of pain control after it. So, so you never have a um, uh, surgeon, cardiac surgeon on a standby? To no, because you are not going in the bloodstream, okay. you know, so it, everything is on the surface of the screen. So there's mu not much bleeding and so. Okay, any interesting insights on possible communication with those needless pacemakers actually, which a lot of research has been telling like, the future may be a subcutaneous icery on the top of maybe a meat Yes, and there's a lot of interest that you can have, you can have a leadless pacemaker and a subcutaneous ICD, so there's nothing in the, you know, there's no hardware in the heart. But now the newer generation subcutaneous ICD will even have pacing function. So, but leadless pacemaker, you're still putting something inside the heart. But with this new thing with sub-Q ICD, there will be nothing in the heart and it might be much more attractive. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good. Great. Thanks a lot. Do you have any other questions about EP or anything else? Any cl clinical case or anything like that? Uh, any questions? About yeah. Uh, I will be showing some of them. In oh, you will? Okay, perfect. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.